Okay, everybody, welcome to Open Textbook Network's Pub 101. This is our penultimate meeting in which we talk about editing and project planning with our partners at Scribe. I'm going to start uh, with a couple of remarks before um, starting a conversation with Elvis and Mike who are joining us. So as I just mentioned, um, this is our penultimate meeting and that means our time together is drawing to a close. But as I said before, I hope you remember it does not have to be goodbye. Um, you can join the publishing co-op at the OTN and almost all of the facilitators and other colleagues new and experienced are there and able to help you in the moment when you're working on projects or starting your program. And that includes Elvis and Mike, they are in that group so they can consult on scribe questions. We also meet informally about once a month at tea time sessions and have other trainings and opportunities related to publishing, um, including press books trainings. Uh, so please think about joining the co-op. There's no additional cost. There's no, <laughs> no obligation. It really is just a community of people who are working in the publishing space um, and who might want to turn to each other for support. I would also like you to think about before our ultimate meeting to reflect on the Pub 101 experience for you so far. Um, I will have a survey about uh, Pub 101 in general. As you know, I've been asking for your feedback about the publishing curriculum units. This will be more about the meetings and kind of the whole kit and caboodle. So I look forward to your responses to that. So today's meeting and our final meeting next week are really a transition into thinking about the editing design and production process, which is often called EDP for short in the publishing world. Basically the process of getting a book ready for publication, the final stages, the final steps. The author has finished writing and now it's really just getting everything ready. So we've talked a lot about front loading work and the payoffs for you and everyone involved in anticipating and doing things um, early rather than kind of uh, fixing them up or cleaning them up at the end. And we talked a little bit about style guides uh, last week and we'll talk a little bit more about them this week. As you all know, it's a tool that you can use early on in the process to save yourself some work later. And that's true both as an author and as a publishing organization. If you are in the role of cleaning up or editing the work, a style guide is really a way to establish consistency in an open textbook or another publication between chapters between authors, if this is a multi-author book, I would say even more of a reason to use a style guide so that things are consistent between those chapters. And then also, of course, between the author and the publisher. And as Carla mentioned, a style guide may even be something that you want to um, state clearly in the MOU so that you both or all know that you're on the same page about what style guide you're using. So to kick us off to talking more about style guides, editing, design, and production, I'm going to do a quick poll and learn more about your experience. So number one, what style guides are you all familiar with? Maybe all of these, maybe none of these. Let us know. Number two, what might be the impacts of a poorly edited textbook? Select all that apply. For example, maybe leaders are distracted, or excuse me, learners are distracted by inconsistencies. There may be misspellings and typographic errors that undermine credibility. Uh, it may be a positive, an opportunity for students to contribute to copy editing and proofreading, or I don't really see any, any impact of a poorly edited book. And then number three, how might you evaluate if an open textbook needs editing? Again, you can select all that apply. You might see a chapter's poorly written. You might notice misspellings and punctuation. Your author may know English as an additional language and the author maybe has not published before. Which of these do you think might suggest editing is in the future? Responses are still coming in. I'll give it a couple more seconds. Let the suspense build. And end the poll. Okay, 
Everybody here knows APA. Almost everybody here also knows Chicago MLA and some others know others. Um, if you want to type in your other style guide that you're familiar with, maybe it's in-house or special, please do so in the chat. Maybe you'll find others, others who know other. Uh, what might the impact of a poorly edited textbook be? Almost everybody is thinking about the reader or the learner and how they may be distracted by inconsistencies, as well as undermining credibility. And then also seeing um, the opportunity perhaps for students to contribute to the development of the publication. And then finally, um, everybody uh, considered most of these to be reasons uh, why editing may be helpful for a book. Thank you for your thoughts. So I'm now going to introduce our guests. Elvis Ramirez is a project manager and book developer at Scribe. And in his role, he manages the production process, including evaluating manuscripts to determine what sort of editorial production and design services they might need in order to make them stronger. He also provides estimates for those services and steers the manuscript through the process. And Elvis is joined today by Michael Miller, or Mike, if you prefer. He's a production manager at Scribe, and Mike's role is to handle typesetting and design for print production, as well as other responsibilities. So I've invited Mike and Elvis here today because they're publishing professionals. And so I'm not necessarily asking them to talk about all the things so that you then feel like you all need to emulate what they do and, and how they do it, but rather to share with you an example of, um, of how it's handled in the publishing industry and get greater understanding and get some tips from the pros. So um, in the session, I also anticipate you'll learn more about how you can work with Scribe as a member of the co-op. They are our partners, and um, we'll say more about that in a few minutes. So Elvis, if you could get us started, could you please tell us more about Scribe and what it is? Sure. Thanks, Karen. Um, so Scribe is a publishing services company, right? Me and Mike, and we have uh, others on our team here. Um, we essentially provide services like uh, design, typesetting, editing, proofreading, indexing services. Uh, we are now delving into the creation of alt text. Um, we also work in, um, um, in ebooks and things of that nature. So we pretty much cover all the aspects that a publishing house might need. Um, we don't publish ourselves, but we provide those services. Uh, we're located in three locations down here in Fort Lauderdale, although I guess right now, Mike, we're all over the place, right? Because we're all working remotely. Uh, but we're down here in Fort Lauderdale, um, Allentown, which is where uh, Mike is at, and then um, the, our main office, which is in Philadelphia. Um, and yeah, so we essentially, um, you know, we cater to a bunch of clients from self-published authors who just need like editing or who actually want the full service suite, if you can call it that. Um, and also uh, we uh, cater to uh, publishing houses, university presses, and so on. And there's a big list of all of our clients. Uh, but for example, Rutgers University is one of our clients uh, and we work with them publishing their books. Um, and there's others uh, that we work with um, that I won't go into detail here. So that essentially covers what we, what we do. We started, um, I believe it was 93, um, when David uh, worked with the University of Pennsylvania, I believe. Um, and from there, we grew into what we are today. So that's sort of a brief history of what we are. Um, and yeah, so if you guys have any questions um, later on about what we do and who we work with and all that, we are more than happy to answer. I don't know if Mike wanted to say something. I saw you're unmuted. No, you're good. Okay. Not, not okay. Yet. You got you got it covered. <laughs> Thanks, Elvis. So um, I put a link to Scribe in the chat so you guys can um, check them out if you wish. Um, and I will mention the University of Minnesota Press is uh, a partner with Scribe. And so let's dig a little bit deeper into some publishing terminology. So Elvis, what is, for example, proofreading and editing and how are they different from each other? All right. So 
what we consider editing or manuscript editing is when we go through the document and we make sure the, uh, the manuscript itself um, and we are going like we're making changes usually they are tracked um, directly to the file and also uh, it's a bit more in depth than proofreading. Proofreading is when we're working with the PDF um, and oftentimes proofreading is just almost like a final check where at that point the manuscript is in pretty much final form because it's already been typeset. Um, and we are just checking to make sure that there are no errors or like major errors, like major misspelling errors or errors, for example, in readability and so on and so forth. At that point, usually we don't recommend any uh, changes that involve uh, rewriting for just style or um, you know, author preference or things like that. Meanwhile, while we're editing, uh, manuscript editing, we, are, we can actually recommend that they change, that an author change things uh, for style or for sense and so on and so forth. So it's a little bit more flexible. Um, we always recommend if you have to choose between cotton between manuscript editing and uh, proofreading, choose manuscript editing uh, because oftentimes um, authors will think that they have everything like settled down and that we're ready to go to typeset. And then when we start proofreading, we discover a lot of errors that then cost a lot more money uh, to uh, to fix at that stage because now you have to go into the actual typeset files and fix those rather than just fixing it in Word, sending the track change over to the author, having them approve it, and then applying it. So that's the difference between those two. Um, in editing, there are different levels. We have we usually use light, medium, and heavy, um, and they just all that indicates is that a light edit is essentially checking for grammar, syntax, spelling, and so on very light we're not worried about sort of like the style that the author is using or anything if it, if it makes sense we pretty much leave it alone um, and that goes all the way up to heavy or developmental editing where we are actually in contact with the author and having back and forths about what um, what needs to be done to their manuscript to make it the very best that it can be and so those are essentially the differences between those two Thanks. So Elvis, you mentioned um, that proofreading is, at a, is a final step in mm -hmm. your process at Scribe because it's already in a PDF form. You're just kind of making sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed because things have been designed and typeset. So Mike, can you talk a little bit about what design and typesetting are? Uh, sure. So um, what Elvis deals with in editing is um, cleaning up the words so that the words the author writes are the words the author means to write and will convey uh, the meaning textually, okay? Um, when we speak out loud, um, we convey more information non-verbally than we do verbally, right? Tone of voice, um, pitch, uh, body language, all that stuff conveys meaning that is completely, we um gets lost in type uh, it, when it's just words. Design is we're um, going to design font choice, the trim size, the which is the size of the book page, um, whether there are any ornamentations or is this going to be color. The design is the entire process of designing the aesthetic of how the book looks and the purpose of that is it's the nonverbal communication of your written textbook. So it's it is um, enhancing the message of the author um, through the way type actually looks on the page or on the screen if it's an ebook. Great. Uh, oh, so sorry. that's what design is for. Mm -hmm. uh, and then typesetting, the difference between design and typesetting. Um, Typesetting is making sure that that aesthetic that you've set up during the design process is consistently applied to the entirety of your textbook. Um, so, you know, if editing is making sure that your style guide of uh, is applied throughout your entire manuscript, typesetting is making sure that your design is applied consistently throughout your entire manuscript. Uh, and what uh, Karen sharing her screen now um, where we have a sample of um, a book that we designed here at Scribe uh, and uh, so like for instance so this is textbook um, 
we have lesson two very big and bold in uh, red type uh, in the upper left to let someone know this is the beginning of a new a new topic right this is obviously a chapter opener page uh, and uh, we chose this one because it has a good uh, good uh, setup of the hierarchy of so preparation and teacher background knowledge those are the biggest ideas the biggest organizing ideas on this page thus they're in the largest bone bold type uh, and then the uh, the language of energy co uh, conversion light energy and energy transfer from the Sun those are all uh, subheads like if you were thinking of this as an outline those would be subheadings of preparation and because they're all uh, typeset at the same using the same font the same color uh, the same spacing above it visually conveys to the reader that these ideas are equally important underneath the heading of preparation. Um, I wasn't sure if we were going to, yeah. there's more here to look at, Mike. Right. I'm just um, Yeah, I, yeah, no, that's good. Um, so uh, this, we have some bulleted lists. Uh, this particular sample was set up to show how we structure a manuscript and how that translates into a design. But I thought it had a number of good uh, examples of different types of elements that often show up in textbooks, like that building coherence there is a sidebar. Uh, and so because we have it in a box, it visually conveys to the reader that this information is related to the stuff on the page, but it's its separate own unit. Um, Sorry, this scrolling through a PDF is apparently asking my computer to do a lot. <laughs> oh, okay, it's, it's that's not a problem. Little, it's being a little clunky. Um, oh, but, I can talk just a little bit. Of, oh, yes, there we are there. Okay. Um, just a little bit about that running foot there where it says lesson two, what makes air hot, teaching the lessons. Um, those are all ways you can set up a book that to help your reader navigate it better because uh, it lists what chapter we're in, the, the lesson number, the lesson title, um, and including what subsection. So those sort of things, uh, if you were being thoughtful about when you're designing the book, can give the reader uh, useful information. Thanks, Mike. I really like the metaphor of type and design being the nonverbal communication of a, of a book. I think that's great. And uh, as Mike mentioned, I'm just going to briefly point out, but we're not going to jump into it today, the, um, the labels that you see here in the margins, like the X, EXUL, EXULB, PUL. This is the methodology that Scribe uses to set up or structure their documents. And so um, this is uh, something that is possible to do and learn in-house uh, within the OTM Publishing Cooperative and would probably make sense if you were really gonna start like a pretty major operation um, to, to learn how to label documents in this way. Otherwise, you can still work with Scribe and, and not do those things. Um, but I just wanted to, to point out that that's what that is there. I'm gonna stop sharing now unless there's anything else you wanted to point out, Mike. Uh, nope. Uh, I uh, did just want to, um, uh, I had a thought earlier while Elvis was talking about why if you want to make changes, it would, it's more preferable to do it in copy editing rather than proofreading. Copy editing happens before I ever do my job, before I do typesetting, before I do design or typesetting. So therefore, any changes that are made at the copy editing stage involve the editor and the author. Changes that are made at the proofreading stage would involve the editor and the author and the typesetter. And the more people that get involved, the more work it takes to finish it, which is why um, you want to front load your projects as much as possible. Um, getting things uh, straight and organized while it's just the author working on their book by themselves or with guidance is the best way to get um, organizational issues and all that sort of thing uh, in good shape because it's only one person involved. Great point. Thanks, Mike. 
Okay, so um, the two of you have been working with the Open Textbook now for a few years, both in training and in providing services. So Elvis, I was hoping you could review four different examples of how you have supported OTN members just as ways to work on a book and um, talk about the different ways that books are made. Sure. I prepared a couple examples with the help of Karen to, uh, to share with you guys, um, not on screen, just um, via voice, but um, I want to piggyback on something that um, I did miss when I was talking about editing and proofreading, uh, which is the, the idea of style guides, which we you know, began um, this class discussing. Um, when we talk about style guides, uh, and this is important just for in, ge in general, whenever you use a style guide, what you're doing is doing a lot of what Michael was sort of talking about, but just for editing and proofreading, which is setting up a set of rules so that everybody's on the same page, right? And that's the way that we use uh, style guides, style sheets uh, here uh, at Scribe. We often set those up right at the beginning before editing. Um, so that way, everybody who looks at the manuscript will also look at that style sheet or that style guide and will know what to expect. And what that'll do is that will negate sort of a lot of back and forth, a lot of having to answer the same question over and over again, uh, because it's all in the style sheet. If the style sheet says use serial commas, for example, then you know that you're using serial commas. And if you find one that's not being used, well, then um, you know that that's an error and that that needs to be fixed. So I just wanted to point that out. Didn't want to have that um, just floating out there. Uh, so for examples for uh, clients um, with the OTN that we work with, uh, the first one, these are all at different stages. The first one um, is Sunny at Capulani uh, Community College. Um, she's currently working with us to get the project going. So we're not actually in the project yet, but uh, part of what we do is we sort of consult with um, all OTN members when they're going to use us for any of their services. And then we provide, at that point, we provide estimates. Uh, we look at the file, we vet it, which is essentially just going through and making sure that what we expect to see in the file is in the file. And if there's something missing to go ahead and get that fixed beforehand. Um, and we also provide sort of scheduling and, and sort of the forward looking uh, idea and saying, hey, you know, this is how long it's gonna take. This is what we're expecting. These are the roadblocks. These are the issues that we're seeing handling all of that up front, like Michael said, where we want to get all of that handled so that way later on, we don't have to worry about those things. So with Sunny, what we've been doing, she's been sending us the manuscript in the stages that they're at, um, and that it is, and um, we essentially review it and then give her feedback and say, hey, you know, we need these devices, um, pedagogical devices, sidebar tables, things like that, to make this into a real textbook. Um, and you know, you may want to go back to the author and ask them about that now. And in all of that, you know, we've come up with sort of a plan so that we've given all our estimates, we've given all our feedback, and then once the manuscript is ready, we'll be ready to go. And all it will be, we'll be sending the manuscript to us, we'll take a look at it again, make sure nothing has changed from that initial, um, that initial vet, and then we'll proceed uh, with the plan that we've already discussed, right? And during that time, we'll also be communicating uh, with Sunny. So right now she's working out funding for that uh, project. And so we're on standby, but we pretty much know where we're going to go with the project. So that's part of what we do here. Um, and then another example of another client that we've worked with is Stephanie Buck at Oregon State. Um, and essentially with Stephanie, what we've done is that we're not handling the project management aspect. We're not even handling the typesetting or design. All we're doing is the editing, right? So Scribe offers essentially our services ad hoc. So if, for example, you're working on a project, you don't have the manpower uh, to go ahead and um, copy edit it, then you can use us for just copy editing and then take care of the rest. We're also working currently uh, testing some certain things out with Pressbooks. Uh, because of our work with Stephanie, uh, because our plan is to be able to provide support for all the files that uh, we work with and the output that essentially we deliver to you. So we want to be able to test to make sure that there's no issues, you know, going into Pressbooks um, when you later on take, for example, an editing, an edited manuscript uh, from us, right? And so it, even in the, in that 
process, there's still that back and forth uh, with um, the author sometimes, but always uh, with you guys as um, the client. Then a third example, we're working with uh, Corinne at um, Virginia Tech, um, and we're currently working on that project. Actually, Michael's designing it, as you can see, he's nodding over there. Um, and it's that one's a full service. We're handling everything except for the composition. Uh, and composition is essentially what uh, Karen was talking about before that applying styles so that everything um, it is labeled as what it is rather than what it looks like. We won't get too deep into that uh, because that is a whole training uh, process in and of itself, but later on, um, I'm sure Karen will mention that. So uh, we're handling everything beyond that point. So Virginia Tech has taken care of um, the composition. We cleaned it up. Um, we're actually not editing that one because the authors decided that they're not going to proofread or edit that, that it, the files are as they are. Um, but we are handling the design, the typesetting, um, and the ebook. Um, so we're taking in, as you can see, we're sort of flexible. And so whenever you have a project, if we can help you with anything, we're more than happy to. And lastly, um, the OTN member with whom we've, we've worked, I think the most, I think so, um, is uh, Karen Bjork at Portland State. We're actually working on one of her projects now, um, which is a um, book on relativity. So there's a lot of equations, a lot of figures and things like that. Um, and so with this one, we again are pretty much taking care of everything except for the composition. Um, and yeah, Karen just noted in the chat that, that uh, the Virginia Tech book is the biosystems engineering textbook. Um, and then the um, Portland State is um, a relativity textbook. And that one, um, we've had to go back and forth and deal with equations and things like that with the author. We've actually been in contact with the author along with Karen um, so that the communication is clear and it's there. So essentially, whenever we work with any client, but specifically with the OTN clients, um, we are looking to essentially help you uh, with as much as you need us to help you with. We, we're not trying to tell you like, let us manage everything, unless we feel like us managing everything might actually save you money in the end. Uh, for example, with Karen's book um, at Portland State, uh, we ran into a, a couple issues where we vetted it, we looked at it, we thought we were going to be able to handle certain things in a certain way, um, but it turns out that it, we ran into even greater issues. So we've opened up those uh, that line of communication with Karen, kept her uh, up to date as we go along, so that way nobody's ever in the dark or wondering where their project is or wondering if it's a... It's, uh, a money sink, right? Um, and so, yeah, so those are some examples of some of the clients that we've worked with. Um, and yeah, I think I'll throw it back to you, Karen, at this point. Thanks. So you guys may remember, uh, I think it was last week that was Corinne, Corinne was with us, right? Um, Corinne mentioned that Elvis sends weekly updates. And so you always know, you know, the status of the project, what's going on with the project, and you don't have to kind of wonder if it fell into a black hole. So um, I put a, a link in the chat there to the philosophy um, textbook that was published through Scribe and Katie just put a note in chat and said that um, she was involved in the Portland State project with Karen and Elvis and that they have been very helpful and uh, she's learned a lot through working with them. And I do think that Katie brings up uh, a really um, huge benefit of working with Scribe in terms of learning. Um, it's not just that you're um, sort of handing over work that you may not have the capacity to do. It is also really helpful as Elvis started um, talking about different examples and talking about working with Sunny at Capilani Community College. The back and forth is really just, you know, Sunny learning how to work with an author, learning how to prepare a manuscript, learning, you know, at what stage should I ask her to do this particular thing. Um, and so they're very generous, I think, with their time um, and with, you know, figuring out how to get things done. So Elvis, uh, continuing with this Portland State um, project as a case study. Um, so Karen or Katie sends you the manuscript and says, I think we're there. Here we go. What happens next? What, ha what happens to that manuscript and how do you get it ready to share with the world? So the first thing that we would do, we would take the manuscript, uh, open it up, and essentially scroll through the entire thing. 
making sure to know, for example, tables, equations, figures, um, block quotes, sidebars, all these things that um, will have an impact on the, on the actual development of the manuscript. So for example, if you have a manuscript that is just uh, text and heads, that's a lot easier for us to deal with than, for example, what we do with the OTN, which are textbooks that have a lot of um, you know, pedagogical devices like sidebars, figures, charts, and things like that that need to be preserved um, and treated in a certain way, especially in design. So we take a look at that. Oftentimes here at Scribe, I will send the manuscript to our editorial team to have them take a look at so to make sure that there's nothing that I'm missing. Then I'll send it over to Michael who will look at it and say, this is what I'm expecting for design and typeset. And then all of that, I compile essentially a report that then goes back to Karen or Katie or whoever sent, uh, sent me the, um, the manuscript. And at that point, we have a conversation and say, this is how much we think it's going to cost this based on what we've run into now. As I said before, if there's anything that comes up in as we're working that sort of throws our estimations off, uh, we'll be sure to communicate that uh, long before we're actually there, right? And so um, we go through and we go through all that once everybody's on the same page, because that's the important thing. Um, and to make sure, for example, during editorial vets, uh, we often have to send a manuscript back to an author because it's easier for them to fix references or things like that. And that actually ends up saving money rather than um, having us go through and trying to learn what the author uh, was intending, right? Or sometimes there's issues like there's a manuscript that we were currently working on where none of the endnotes were linked. Um, and so we actually had to go back and verify like, hey, is this what you want? Because if you want it this way, it's going to be very difficult to then link those later on. Uh, it turns out that that was intended, but we ask questions like that just to make sure that we are not like forging ahead and then running into problems later. And then um, at that point, once we have all the conversations done, everything and everyone's on the same page, that's when we actually start either with composition, which is that applying the structure, um, or um, composition cleanup if somebody has already done the composition and they go ahead um, and send that file to us. And we call it cleanup because we just go through and check to make sure that everything uh, fits well within our systems. Um, at that point, um, after composition, we, there's several rounds of QC, um, and we essentially can go through the whole project um, sort of timeline, but essentially it goes copy editing, then go back to the author, uh, then it goes back to the author, and then um, we go, uh, the files come back to us, we accept changes, uh, during that time, we're usually designing. Um, and then after that, um, that's correct. Uh, QC is quality control. Um, forgive me, because I use it so often at this point, QC is just QC. Uh, but yes, it's quality control. It's done at every step. And so um, at each major step, better said. Uh, so right after composition, right after copy editing, right after design, right after typesetting, after proofread, and after the eBooks. And it's actually in that order. Um, so with, after we go through all of that, at every step we are communicating with you and, and letting you know where things are and how, what's coming up next. So you never have to ask what the status of your project is. Um, and then after that, essentially, the project is done. And we deliver you final files, uh, which include the Word files, the um, SML files, the uh, typeset files, the InDesign files, everything that we have you'll have so that way, you know, later on, if you want to um, make a new edition or do a reprint or anything like that, all of that is available to you. And so that's essentially the rundown of what happens from beginning to end, really concise, but I think you guys get the picture. Thanks, and so I appreciate your listing of the different file types and that, of course, you as the client are the owner of those file types. They're not kept at Scribe. It's not, you know, their publication. All of those files are yours, including the Word files, which many faculty authors are most comfortable working in Word. And so if you did ever receive a request for an editable file, 
while Microsoft Word is, um, you know, problematic in many ways, it is still a very commonly used popular platform in other ways. And so there are, of course, trade-offs. And I'd also like to highlight, even if you don't work with Scribe, the process that Elvis described of vetting a manuscript is very helpful to keep in mind. And it's one reason why we suggest requesting a chapter sample at the beginning. That's kind of like a mini vet. So you can identify you know, any problems um, earlier on in the, in the writing process, ideally. Um, but again, that process is so helpful when you receive the manuscript you know, don't start um, with kind of the mindset, which I typically <laughs> enter at something into, of like, okay, I'm going to start working on this page one. It's really um, wise to say, I'm not working on this yet. I'm evaluating what's here. I'm, I'm checking it out. I'm vetting it. You know, let's, let's see what the issues are, because it, it may make sense to, you know, send the manuscript back in its entirety and say, hey, you know, I noticed this issue you know, I, I, I will need you to fix it. Uh, even better if you can say, hey, I noticed this issue as we agreed on in the MOU, you're going to write the alt tags for the images. Um, and I see those are missing. So, you know, please go through the, the manuscript and, and add those. So I just think vetting is a really great, um, really great step. So Elvis, um, you mentioned uh, identifying the integrated pedagogy, darn it integrated pedagogical devices with Sunny. And uh, Sunny talked a little bit in the last tea time about how she approached that work with Cheryl, the author. Mm -hmm. And so can you and Mike just say a little bit about how you make those consistent throughout the book, um, along with all of the headers that Mike talked about and definitions. Um, for example, how do you ensure that glossary terms are all you know, bold throughout the book and actually in the glossary? Sure. So the answer to that is what we call composition, what we've already mentioned a couple times. Um, and all that is, if we're talking in essentially layman's terms, is applying word styles to uh, the manuscript to make sure that we are labeling things as what they are rather than what they look like. Uh, word has this, um, as uh, since we mentioned how problematic it can be, um, Word um, has this interesting thing where if like you are bolding something or making something italic or anything like that. If you take that text straight out of Word and dump it into any other text editor, likely the bolding and the italics will be gone, right? And so if you, if you are able to apply a style which you can carry through um, in XML, which is what we do, and again, we're not going to get too into it, um, if you can apply styles to indicate that bold and that italics, then you can keep that formatting throughout the entire process from editing all the way up to uh, the final product. So when, um, when we go ahead and compose a manuscript, what we're doing is we're applying those styles. And then later on, uh, when, uh, for example, Michael will take the design, and he can talk a little bit more about this. He can say like all AH or A heads will be blue and 14 point font or whatever it might be. Um, and then that way it's consistent throughout the book because we've done that work beforehand um, and it actually makes it a lot easier uh, to then flow in the text and typeset um, later uh, when it gets to that, in that uh, stage. Um, so the way that we keep everything consistent is by tagging everything right at the beginning. Um, so that way we know like all A heads are this, all B heads are this, all, um, all you know, C heads are X, Y, or Z and so on and so forth, right? And so uh, Karen's sharing an image of essentially our process, the process that I've described uh, very quickly uh, earlier. Um, what, right there at the beginning, you'll see that we have compose or composition. That is the step that I'm talking about now. And that's how we make everything consistent throughout and throughout the life of the project. So when we compose, what we're doing is we're ensuring that the intentional formatting is carried throughout so that way it can serve a purpose in design and something's not just bold because it looks good in bold, but actually it's bold because it's a key term or something of that nature. And Mike, I don't know if you want to say anything more about composition um, and its purpose. You're, you're muted. So evidently, I didn't want to say anything. Um, I just wanted to point out that um, when you compose, we're, we're defining things by their structure in the document. What job do they do in the document? This glossary term is 
um, highlighted is to call all the reader's attention to the fact that it's a glossary term. Um, I could do when I'm designing it, I could do that through making it bold. I could do that through making it italic. I could do that through making it a different font. I could do that by making it a different color if it's a color pub publication. Um, and I'd have to see how that interacts with all the other elements to make sure that the reader's attention is properly called to that particular um, that particular uh, piece of text. Um, so when we structure things by, when we tag things by how they are, how they're structured, that is their job in the, uh, in the document, I can, it's a lot easier when I'm making changes during design um, that I send a design sample and maybe I might make a design sample in color and then um, funding for color printing falls through and suddenly we need to make this a black and white book. Um, that is the kind of thing that happens. Um, I'm not going to have to go through and change all everything that's blue to bold. Um, I can decide that, okay, well, A heads used to be blue and B heads used to be green, um, but now we're going to make them uh, bold and semi-bold. And because the structure of the document uh, stays the same, regardless of how it renders in the typeset, um, that gives us a lot of flexibility, both in the production of the print book and in the production of the ebook. Um, yeah. And so essentially, um, what we do now at the beginning, talk about front loading everything in the project, what we do at the beginning uh, will make life easier later on. So if you look at that pre-production stage uh, in this image that Karen is sharing, then um, everything that we do here makes, for example, the production part a whole lot easier and makes the, electri the electronic portion of it, so the ebook, um, a whole lot easier. Um, versus, as Michael said, having to go in and change every key term to X, Y, or Z because we didn't structure it properly. Now we can just go ahead and change things that are tagged as a key term uh, to be what we want it to be, and then that'll be it. Um, and so relating this a little bit to accessibility, um, when we compose and when we're doing everything, we're getting everything together, we're also thinking about accessibility. Everything that we do here at Scribe um, is by default accessible. So our ebooks are accessible. They will meet the standards um, as they are required by the different organizations, um, the bare minimum. But um, while we're, for example, when we're vetting, we ask about accessibility and what the purpose of it, what the purpose of the book will be, and if certain accessible options are worth it. Um, and at that stage, if for example, we want, we know that this is going to be um, uh, something for a screen reader um, and we need to differentiate between italic as italic and italic for emphasis as in when a screen reader reads it, uh, then we're able to do that. Uh, and we can get into accessibility, um, I believe, another time um, and we can get in depth to all our accessibility options, but everything that we do is sort of structured on that, that we apply this structure from the beginning, and then that makes the document more accessible, it makes things easier later on, and it makes the production of any manuscript uh, that much more even cost effective. Um, and yeah, I think that should answer that question. Karen, I don't know if um, yes. there's something else you want to talk oh, about. Thank you. And so um, Elvis talked us through, you know, all the all the things that he does uh, when a manuscript comes to him. Now, Mike, when does it come to you for typesetting and design, and, and why does it come to you at that point? Uh, yeah, so uh, a project comes to me after after the copy edit is complete because that's when the book is intact. It's been structured. It's been cleaned, and we're not anticipating. Um, major additions or subtractions of text at this point. Uh, the book is pretty well, as far as the actual words that the author needs wants to convey, is pretty well set. Uh, and therefore, um, that's the time that you want to get into uh, designing and typesetting so that you know you don't want to typeset a book and then 
oh, we have to add an extra chapter or, oh, that, you know, we have to take this section out of this chapter because that's a bunch of work that needs to be repeated, which just isn't e efficient for anyone. Um, so yeah, it's already been mapped out. It's already been copy edited uh, and it's ready to um, sort of set foot on the stage of the world. And so, you know, we have to get it dressed and ready to, to get out on stage there. Now we're in the theater. I there we are. I keep yeah. mixing my metaphors. <laughs> so um, what kind of differences or what kind of preparations do you take for a print book in the way that Scribe prepares it versus an ebook? Um, so, well, it's pretty much, we're going to be making the same sort of decisions as far as um, how are different aspects going to render, uh, what are the uh, reader expectations going to be, um, and how is that sort of nonverbal communication going to come across on a screen versus, uh, versus a, uh, a printed page. Um, the, a lot of the difference is just in the tools that we use. Uh, like I work in InDesign all day, which is Adobe's uh, page layout program. Um, whereas uh, I very rarely look at uh, CSS, which are ca cascading style sheets, which is how things are determined in things uh, for the, on eBooks. Um, eBooks don't have, um, quite as many options for how things can be designed as I have at my disposal um, as a typesetter. Uh, be, but primarily because when I set up a page as a typesetter, I know exactly how that page is going to look. It's going to look this way, it's going to print on this paper and that's what it's going to be and that's done. And therefore um, I can do what needs to be done to make it render that way. An ebook, we have to keep in mind the fact that an ebook can be read on your phone, an ebook can be read on an e reader, any number of e readers, or tablets, or computer screens, or you can probably read them on your smartwatch. And a scribe ebook needs to function in every one of those uh, vastly different environments uh, in such a way that the reader is going to get the best experience out of it. And so uh, we therefore have to be a little more conservative about the design decisions that we make in eBooks because we have to keep in mind that incredible flexibility of uh, what the reading device is going to bring to it. So. Thank you. And I'll highlight that I know um, more than one project manager has had a conversation with a faculty author who did not understand the differences of the capabilities going into the process. And so we're asking why the ebook didn't look just like the print book. And so it could be something um, just to keep in mind as um, you're working with different faculty. So thank you, Elvis and Michael, for quickly taking us through your publishing process at Scribe. I would now like to invite anyone to ask their questions. Feel free to use chat or unmute. And um, while you are doing that, I will post a document in the chat about working with Scribe. It's um, basically a Q&A with Elvis about how, as a co-op member, you can potentially um, work with them. Uh, Elvis also um, sort of reviewed that when talking about different real world examples from your colleagues. So I will pause now for questions. And that concludes our pause. <laughs> so does that mean we uh, we covered everything you need to know? Susan. Um, I understand the difference if you're going to, your goal is a print book versus an ebook. And for the ebook, you have to consider the different platforms, uh, the different devices the book could be viewed on. What if you have, I know there are some places where they have the ebook 
but print on demand is available. Do you approach doing an ebook differently with that possibility in mind than you would just a flat out ebook design? Did I ask that right? Yeah. Um, well, we would still need to consider that uh, the book would need to be typeset, designed and typeset for print. And whether it's print on demand where they uh, print just one copy at a time when it's ordered, or whether it's a full um, uh, full printing with um, a printing press and film and all that, uh, that from our point of view isn't all that different. We still need to make sure that the book is ready for print, whether the print is on demand or not um, is a secondary concern. Uh, it's sort of like making sure that it checks all the boxes for that particular print vendor but it still needs to be typeset because it's going to be in a physical manifestation on a physical page somewhere. And that's something that we usually take care of um, or ask about during that vetting stage at the beginning. So then that way we know where our, like the final file is going to be uh, or what it's going to be. So then that way it's a lot, it's a lot easier to sort of think about that in the beginning and to make certain um, composition choices and so on and so forth, knowing that this is going to be both print on demand and an ebook. Um, I believe that one of the books that we worked on with Karen Bjork um, is print on demand and it's also EPUB um, and it's available on their, on their site. I don't have the link, but um, I'll see if I can find it. Meanwhile, I don't know if somebody else has other questions. There is a question here from John about what particular limitations or challenges have you found in working with press books in particular at any phase of the workflow? So I can answer that one. Um, at this point, the only real interaction that, are, that we've had with uh, press books was when we were working with Stephanie Buck at Oregon State. Um, we um, we're just doing the editing, as we already mentioned. And so once we sent the edited files with track changes to Stephanie, um, she had a, a little bit of issues, uh, a little bit of an issue importing that Word file into Pressbooks. Um, and we've discussed it and we found out that the issue was actually um, a bit of a slip in communication where uh, we were expecting to get the files back to do the accept changes on that. So that way the file would be clean of all track changes. Um, but because of the production schedule and because of all that, uh, that sort of didn't get done. And uh, Pressbooks does not like track changes in Word. Uh, and that created some of the issues. So uh, that's part of the reason why we want, um, we're working to get access to Pressbooks. So that way we can test out the files um, before we send them to you. And that's something that you don't have to worry about. But other than that, I don't think we've had any real world issues with Pressbooks. Now I will say with Stephanie's projects, we were able to generate HTML. Our tools allow us to do that pretty easily. And because of that, um, that was able to just go right into Pressbooks and look pretty good. So, um, so yeah, so those are the only like real encounters we've had. So hopefully that answers that question. It sounds like it was right on the mark because John was just discussing the possibility of keeping track changes in press books, but hadn't yet tried it. So um, thanks for sharing that experience. Arnie is asking, how do you build the capacity for adaptation and remixing into the design? So these are openly licensed resources that we're talking about. And then you both have talked about um, the well-formed document workflow and how it sort of um, is for the, the life cycle of the project. So maybe talking a little bit about those two things together. Um, yeah, so um, as I said earlier, uh, when I typeset something, it's sort of, it's not set in stone, it's set on paper, but it's set solidly, right? Um, but we work in such a way uh, that I'm expecting after my work is done that uh, uh, content is going to be pulled out and put into the ebook so that any changes I made are propagated through to the next step. And if, and that's pulled out into uh, what we call SCML, which is our scribe markup language, 
which is a true XML markup language, which just means that uh, it's very, very flexible for uh, uh, to be used for multi-purpose publishing. And so any typeset that we do, um, the it's easy for us to pull that out into a pure text file, which could then be remixed however needed to be. Um, chapters could be reshuffled. Um, and uh, uh, it can be worked and ad adapted that way. Uh, and also um, to uh, bring a more concrete example, the biosystems book that we're working on in with uh, Virginia Tech right now, um, it's um, so uh, like 23 chapters, but the textbook is not, when they produce a textbook, it's not always going to be those same 23 chapters. They might group some of them off, pull some of them off. And so we have to design it so that those chapters can function as part of a book and also individually as just little instructional packets. And so we had to keep that in mind when we were designing it uh, so that nothing uh, was dependent on it, the, on its context as far as being next to its neighbors, so to speak, in the book. So um, those are the kind of things that you need to establish very early in the process so that you can keep them in mind when you're doing this, this work. And to add to that, our um, SCML is not uh, proprietary. And so if you get an InDesign file and it has SCML, um, the styles are named after our um, SCML tags, um, you can edit that as, as uh, freely as you're able to. The only thing is, is that we do use, like we provide the InDesign file, so you'll have use InDesign, but um, at the same time, we also provide the SCML, which is that markup language that uh, Michael was just talking about. So that can be uh, usually pulled into pretty much um, anything else. Um, and so we'll also provide you the Word files the, um, and the PDFs themselves so that that way, um, as Karen mentioned, we don't keep, like none of the work that we do um, for you is essentially ours. We always, we're just providing the service of making it. Um, and that work belongs to you and you can make that freely available to anyone uh, so that they can adapt and remix it as they so um, as they so choose and according to the CC license. So um, we will give you all the source files and from there, you know, how somebody chooses to remix it or adapt it is really up to them. So hopefully that, that adds a little bit. Thanks. And I'll add to that, you know, Katie mentioned earlier how much she's learned from working with Scribe. And I think Scribe has also learned from working with us and the open education community in terms of thinking about like, oh, okay, a biosystems engineering textbook that, you know, is going to be more modular or it's going to be, you know, we're going to be rotating out certain chapters and replacing it with other things. You know, I think we're, it's a beneficially, um, a mutually beneficial relationship in figuring out sort of these worlds together. So we are nearly out of time. I appreciate uh, your questions and you joining us today. Please join me in thanking Elvis and Mike for their time. And I hope that you will be back next week for our final Pub 101 meeting. And um, if you have any questions in the meantime, please post them to class notes. I will check in with our shared document there and be posting this video shortly. So I hope that all of you have a good week. And thanks again, Elvis and Mike. Thank you all for having us. Thanks a lot.